The day after the Olympic gymnastics team final, Carrie Strug was carried into a press conference on a leather recliner, her injured ankle resting on a pillow. Carrie was the hero of the games. The night before, 42 million Americans had watched on TV as she landed her final vault attempt on an injured ankle. But it was Dominique Mochianu's score that clinched the gold for the U.S. If any of the reporters asked Dominique about that, it isn't included in this video. What was the pressure like yesterday on the team to actually win? Um, we're, there was a lot of high expectations for the team, but, you know, we pulled it through and we did our best, so we were really happy. At one point, Dominique can be seen sitting between her coaches Bella and Marta Caroli. She's just 14 years old, and she looks utterly lost. My coaches just discarded me right after that. I felt like all my hard work and everything came down to, what, a couple of vaults? For years, Dominique Mociana kept quiet about all she had endured in pursuit of Olympic gold. In 2008, she started speaking out. I got sick and tired of faking it. Oh, yeah, they're great. And then I'm like, not really. Sorry. I wish I could say they were. Trust me, I want to with all of my heart. I want to say they were awesome. But no, they weren't. But Dominique didn't get the response she was hoping for. And I was shunned for almost a decade because of it all. I lost every single financial opportunity. Very few people came to my defense. For the first almost seven, eight years, everyone would leave me out there hanging all by myself. Sports writer Lindsay Gibbs says, that's just the way things were. In gymnastics, your career is so small. You know, it's so short. And it's a selection process to get on these teams. It's not automatic what's a two-point basket and what's a three-point basket, you know? There's some subjectivity. And the competition is so extreme that it encourages you incentivizes you to be quiet, to sit back and to just accept whatever is given to you. But in February of 2018, 156 women testified at the sentencing hearing for Larry Nasser, the former team doctor who's been accused of sexually assaulting more than 500 young women and girls. It was a scandal that could no longer be ignored. The tables have turned, Larry. We are here. We have our voices and we are not going anywhere. The strength that that takes, the courage to buck the system in that way, a system that was basically built to silence you, I think changed gymnastics forever. Dominique was asked to testify in front of Congress, and this time, people listened. I have firsthand knowledge of how the culture set the stage for other atrocities to occur. It is a culture of fear, intimidation, and humiliation. Once gymnasts started speaking up against the Crowleys and Larry Nasser, they found the voice to talk about other things that were wrong with their sport. It's about fighting for what they're worth. And, you know, for these gymnasts, that means an environment free from abuse. There's a revolution going on in women's sports, and it's not just happening in gymnastics. Every step of the way, women have kept fighting, and they've been able to use what happened in 96 as an example of what happens when they are put on the biggest stages. From Dear Media and Together, I'm Michelle Kwan. This is Summer of Gold. This is Episode 6, The Generation That Won't Shut Up. Lindsay Gibbs didn't watch women's sports when she was young, except for the Olympics. And she definitely remembers 96. Very, very well. Carrie Strug's vault is cemented into my brain, is one of my, like, founding sports memories. I actually remember I was at camp. It was just like a day camp, but my grandmother videotaped the Olympics for me. And so I could watch them. Lindsay co-hosts a women's sports podcast called Burn It All Down. I always say my motivation for covering women's sports stems from my anger that I wasn't exposed to them growing up. Lindsay was a huge fan of the Carolina men's basketball team. 
I wish I had been taken and exposed to the WNBA. I wish I had seen Charlotte Smith's game-winning shot for Carolina. Seven tenths of a second left. Tech on top by two. 1994 NCAA Women's Championship game. Carolina hoping for some luck and the perfect shot to give them their first ever women's championship. This was a historic moment for Carolina, but Lindsay wasn't watching. Here's the shot, Charlotte Smith. <laughs> Why wasn't anyone showing me the women's basketball? I would watch SportsCenter all day. Like I was, I would come home from school and just watch SportsCenter and PTI, waiting for them to talk about the Panthers or talk about you know the sports teams I loved. Through osmosis, I became a fan of all these men's sports. (laughs) And yet, with women's sports, nothing until I actively sought it out. Lindsay went to college at NYU. She studied film and television production. I studied a lot about how women are portrayed through media and how much that impacts how we view gender and race and sexuality. One lecture really stuck with Lindsay. It focused on a couple of films with female stars, Jodie Foster's The Brave One and Nicole Kidman's Invasion. In each case, the narrative was the same. All this money was put behind it and it was a flop. And so then the takeaway wasn't that the script was bad or the marketing was bad or anything like that. It was that women can't carry blockbusters. As Lindsay started looking around, she realized this wasn't just a problem in Hollywood. When there was an upset in women's tennis, it was used against women's tennis to talk about how weak the sport was. Whereas when there was an upset in men's tennis, it was how exciting the sport was and how unpredictable, and it was a good thing. At the majors, men and women play on the same courts in front of the same sold out crowds. It's often the same commentators, you know, the same people giving you polar opposite narratives depending on whether it's the men or the women. When Lindsay looks at women's professional sports and all the leagues and teams that have failed over the past 25 years, she sees the same narrative playing out over and over again. Two women's professional basketball leagues were launched in the wake of the 96 Olympics, the WNBA and the ABL. The ABL wanted to very much honor the traditional basketball season. That's sports writer Michelle Smith-McDonald. They wanted to pay the players good salaries, and they were offering the players an alternative to playing overseas. The WNBA, on the other hand, wanted a summer game. They wanted something to put in NBA arenas during the NBA offseason. And the players were still going to have to go overseas to get paid. For the first time ever, women had a choice. Cheryl Swoops, Lisa Leslie, and Rebecca Lobo signed with the WNBA. The rest of the Olympic basketball team went to the ABL. There were a lot of players that initially chose the ABL because they think they had heart for what the ABL was trying to do. But in their head, they had to know that what was happening over at the WNBA might be more sustainable ultimately. In their third season, the ABL suddenly shut down. I was working, I think, at the San Francisco Examiner at the time, and I got the phone call that the ABL folded, and I think I cried. And I think I just, I just, I think I cried for the lost opportunity. I think I cried a little bit because I knew the people who run the league and I knew the heart that they were trying to run the league with. It just felt lousy. It felt lousy because I know they felt like they failed. But the ABL wouldn't be the only women's sports league to fail. The WUSA on packs Mia Hamm, Abby Wambach and the Washington Freedom looking for a spot in the postseason. The WUSA was the world's first fully professional women's soccer league. It was launched in the wake of the 99 Women's World Cup. Julie Foudy was one of the league's founding players. It was one of our little babies, you know, our pet projects we'd wanted forever to start a women's professional league. The league spent $100 million, but it ran out of money after three seasons. For it to fold only three years later was soul-crushing, honestly. There was a lot of excitement. There was a lot of money, but there was no plan. That's goalkeeper Brianna Scurry. Another league called Women's Professional Soccer, or the WPS, launched in 2009. 
the WPS had a decent plan, but not enough funding and money. Like the WUSA, the WPS failed after just three seasons. Leagues as a whole are very, very difficult seeds to plant and grow. And so leagues fail all the time. People assumed that this was going to be easy, an overnight thing, which is ridiculous because it certainly wasn't for men's sports. That's sports writer Lindsay Gibbs again. They just didn't have the patience, the funding, the business plan to sustain it. And of course, was that blamed on the people who launched the league? No, it was blamed on women's soccer, right? Like it was blamed on women. But during all of these ups and downs for women's professional sports, there was one league that survived, the WNBA. It changed everything. That's Sue Bird. When the WNBA launched in 1997, Sue was attending high school at Christ the King in New York. It just opened up this whole new world, and I'm lucky that I live in New York, and I'm lucky that there was a team in New York with the New York Liberty, and I went to games, and seeing just like the crowds and the hype and the excitement Sue went to college at UConn and was the first pick of the 2002 WNBA draft. But by then, the excitement around women's sports that had begun with the 96 Olympics was starting to wear off. Some teams were still going strong, but others had folded and many were struggling. Sue noticed the difference. Yeah, I remember what it was like going to a New York Liberty game as a high school kid. And the opening tip. Winds up in the hands of Cheryl Swoops. Sold out every game. You know, the place would be going crazy. That's my high school experience. And then I remember what it was like when I entered the WNBA and kind of sensing what was happening around us. For some reason, people were looking at our league as like a charity instead of like a viable business. So, you know, people just kind of got tired of the charitable aspect of it, like doing it for the, the right reasons, so to speak, when we should have just been looked at as a business, as an investment. And every time a league failed or a team struggled financially, it caused a backlash against all women's sports. Lindsay Gibbs says we're just now starting to climb out of that. You're starting to see women in sports, in business, take an active ownership role, literally and figuratively, in making sure that these teams and these leagues are built to go the distance and are not at the whim of the latest tech bro who shows a little bit of interest, which is, you know, where they have been for years. But it's not just the women in the boardroom who have changed their tactics. The athletes have too. Twenty-five years ago, Julie Foudy walked into a room and told her fellow soccer players, We are not signing this effing contract. They can F off. But Julie's fight is far from over. Still, only a couple years ago, the men were making more per diem than we were. They're flying better than we were. Some of their hotel things, like those like low-hanging fruit where you're like, What are we doing? How is this something I'm having to bring up still? Yeah, that frustrates the hell out of me. Julie retired from the team in 2004. But back when she was still playing, she'd always bring some of the younger players into the negotiation room. And you're going to sit in these meetings and you're going to hear it because eventually you're going to be the ones fighting for these things. This became a tradition. And in 2015, they took their fight to the next level. Whew. <laughs> The next level, for sure. It started when they won the 2015 Women's World Cup. The World Cup champion U.S. women's soccer team is being honored with a historic ticker tape parade right through the Canyon of Heroes in Manhattan. It is the first ever ticker tape parade to honor an all-women sports team. It is also New York's first ticker They had that parade. big ticker tape parade, and then they immediately harnessed that power and used it all to fight for equal pay and equal conditions. A year after winning the Women's World Cup, the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team is fighting to get equal pay for equal play. Yesterday, five of the biggest stars of the women's We saw them start to use social media for this equal play, equal pay campaign that they launched. 
The team did a media blitz. Here's Alex Morgan on Access Hollywood. For us, having the success that we've had, I think it's a no-brainer for them to invest in this and to see the future women in soccer to continue to grow. Four years later, the equal pay issue still wasn't resolved. So the team continued their fight during the 2019 Women's World Cup in France. And everyone was like, oh, they're such big favorites. Oh, they're just going to trounce the competition. But I thought, but the pressure they put on themselves by fighting for equal pay during this tournament, you're playing for so much more than yourself. You've set the stakes up so high, and now you have to perform. There's a swagger to that group that I love. That's Julie Foudy again. It's about, here's the standard we want to set for all women in all industries and in all silos, and we're going to plant this flag because we think it's that important. And we're willing to risk losing a World Cup, which is everything to a soccer player, a World Cup. We're going to risk that. But we think we can actually do both because we're that badass. And they are. Like, okay, yeah, we can do it all. And they did. For the fourth time, the United States of America are crowned champions of the world. And for the very first... But it's not just the women's soccer team that's fighting for all women in all industries. When the WNBA players formed their union, they had the same thing in mind. And so much of that came from the players being together and finding their voices during those 96 games. The union was formed just 15 months after the WNBA played its first game. They signed their first collective bargaining agreement the next year, in 1999. You just do not see unions form and CBAs won in the second year of a pro league, you know? Especially when it's a women's league that's being told, just be grateful to be here. When I entered the league, that's what the vibe was. It was, be happy with what you're given. That's Sue Bird again. Nobody said those words to me, but like, I caught the drift. Like, it was there, it was present. And I think a lot of women, not just in sports, a lot of women, you know, for for a long period of time, have felt that way, that we should just be happy to have the opportunity at all. And Sue Bird was happy for a while, until she wasn't. I think the moment for me was joining the executive committee for our our union, WMBPA, and going into the CBA negotiation and being like, hold up, wait, this is not good. Sue had worked with the union before, but this was the first time that she was actually in the room for the CBA negotiations. The CBA is where you get things done. That's where the movement happens. That's where you can push things forward. That's where you can ask for more money, ask for 100% maternity leave, like get things in writing. These are the moments. And I think in the past, and this is no knock on former players, I would have been in the same boat if I was on the executive committee then as well. It was always just, okay, we should just be happy with the money we have. So can we just get like, you know, maybe an extra meal or like, you know, something small. We never really went big. When I got on that executive committee and it was this time for negotiations, it was like, no, we got to go big. On the court, these women are the best in the world. But when they entered the negotiation room, some of their swagger would disappear. You had the league on the other side and there's lawyers and there's like, all you know, all the owners are these like super successful business people. And we're basketball players. So you kind of assume, and I think this does happen to women, definitely happens to me, where you're like, okay, everybody's probably smarter than me in here. After each meeting, the players would compare notes. Did you think this? And I would be like, yeah, I thought that. I'd be like, did you think this? Like, yeah, well, I was thinking that too. And then we started to realize like, wait a minute, we're the smartest people in this room because we're the ones playing and we're the ones with the experience and we're the ones living this and we're the ones that understand what our day-to-day life is like. So we're actually the ones with the expertise in this room. And the minute that flipped, it just the position of power that we can now come from changed everything. It just takes opening your mouth that one time, and then it's floodgates. The Players Association adopted a slogan, Bet on Women. Lindsay Gibbs loved it. To me, it moved the conversation past this baseline economic ticket stubs and TV contract and viewership conversation, and it framed the conversation as an investment the way we think of men's sports as an investment. 
Now the WNBA has placed what it calls a big bet on women. The player's new eight-year union contract is being called a game changer for women's equality. It will boost the average player's salary over six figures for the first time. And the contract will allow players to collect their full salary on maternity leave. Once the door opened, we like smashed through it in all the right ways. And there's something else. In the past, players thought they had to act a certain way to attract fans to their sport. We were being pushed in different directions, you know, to be more feminine, to be more, you know, this, to be more that. Maybe wear a tighter uniform, that kind of a thing. Players worried that asking for more money or speaking out on social issues would alienate fans. But that's not what happened. We needed to be authentic to who we were as people in our league, who we were as women in this world. We're doing that now, and you're seeing the excitement that's being generated by that. People are drawn to that. They're drawn to authenticity. And Lindsay Gibbs says, it's working. We've seen during the pandemic when sports everywhere are being ravaged, when ratings are down everywhere you look, ratings in women's sports are rising. And the athletes are just getting started. Picture this, a huge hotel ballroom filled with racks upon racks of dumbbells, inclined benches, rows and rows of barbells, stacks of brightly colored weights. That was the men's weight room at the 2021 NCAA March Madness basketball tournament. Now picture the women's weight room at the same tournament sponsored by the same organization. Just a single rack of dumbbells and a couple of yoga mats. I, I don't even feel right calling it a rack of weights. <laughs> like, there's more than that, like, in one station at the Orange Theory classes, <laughs> like, as far as weights go. A photo of these two rooms, side by side, went viral on Twitter. It was such a powerful image. The second I saw it, I knew this is going to make an impact. About six hours later, the NCAA issued a statement saying there just wasn't enough space to provide the women with a better weight room. Four hours after that, this video was posted to TikTok and released on Twitter. I got something to show y'all. So for the NCAA, That's the University of Oregon's Sedona Prince. They're one of the top women's college basketball players in the country. Here's our practice court, right? And then here's that weight room. And then here's all this extra space. I mean, you couldn't find more space. Like, I've never seen so much empty space. Sedona was able to just clearly showcase this is the NCAA's excuse that they've given. And hey, let me turn the camera around and show you that excuse is not at all true. If you aren't upset about this problem, then you're a part of it. That message coming directly from an athlete at a major sporting event was powerful. That was especially crucial given that media in COVID times is very limited in person, right? Like it's unlikely that reporters were able to get into that room. So it was on the players to tell that story. That was a story that if it hadn't been for the players, literally would not have gotten out. Sedona's video went viral with 100,000 retweets overnight. The next day... The NCAA announced that they were fixing the problem. And the day after that... Guess what, guys? We got a weight room, yeah! We got a ton more dumbbells, look at that. Look at all these racks for squats and whatever we want to do. It happened amazingly quickly, almost like it wasn't that big of an ask. <laughs> like, in the first place. <laughs> Almost like there was literally no excuse not to have it done. <laughs> Sedona Prince has more than two and a half million TikTok followers. Their TikTok is just 
full of their relationship, a day in the life. It's just very clear that Sedona is comfortable communicating through social media, that that's how they grew up. That's how they uh, learn to express themselves. And I love their TikTok. Like it is just the most fun, down to earth, relatable content, even though I can't really relate to them at all. Sedona is part of a generation of athletes who are using social media to publicize their sports, build their brands and air their grievances. This is the example that Sedona's now grown up with, you know, whether it was the women's soccer team demanding equal pay or, you know, most pertinently, the women of the WNBA protesting everything from, you know, for black lives to fighting for better contracts. This is all they've really grown up knowing is that this is not only okay, but expected. Sue Bird sees it too. The truth is, I'm probably not going to be the beneficiary of, you know, the first million dollar contract signed in the WNBA. I know I'm not. I know I'm not. My, my knees will have fallen off before that is even possible. But I think this generation, where it is now, all that buildup, all this shoulder standing, I think what has happened is now this generation, they're ready. You can tell. You can tell they're ready to jump on it. The women of the 96 Olympics, those Title IX babies, they had to fight just for the right to play. But today's athletes are entering a different world. Women's sports now are not just a part of the pop culture, but a part of the financial culture, a part of the labor culture, a part of every part of American culture. We're only this far, we're only to this generation that won't shut up <laughs> and that won't uh, you know, put down the TikTok. We're only here because of what got started in 1996. 1996 was one of the most important years in women's sports history. The women of those games were pioneers, focused on blazing a trail. But athletes today have the platform to stand up and speak out. And they're just getting started. <laughs> 